started, let's open up with the Lord in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Announcements. We have actually quite a few announcements. Um, you'll see these on the inside edge of the pews. They're prayer request cards. I'm just trying to keep up with all the prayer requests. So if you get a moment, write your prayer request down, and then on your way out, you can drop it in the basket. And so what you know is on Tuesday mornings, members of us are getting together and praying specifically for the requests that are in the basket and having a dedicated hour of prayer. Uh, let's see, other announcements. Admin Council is coming up, not tonight, but next Sunday night. Um, yes, birthdays. Rhonda Dykes, where are you at? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a charge conference coming up November 1st. Uh, October also is Trunk or Treat, so remember that's coming up. Start thinking about your ideas, what we're going to do. I'm sure it's going to look a little differently this time around because there's some things we just can't do. So, uh, we're still going to try to pull it off. Uh, praise team and practices. Any, any Anything on that? We're still looking at where right now we're trying to do a group um, collaboration on that, but we don't have a, a specific date right now. All right. So stay tuned. Uh, a shout out to all those folks. There are so many people that helped out for the hurricane relief uh, Boxing up, separating, organizing, uh, reached out to other churches, other organizations to make this a central point. So thank you to everyone in the church that helped with that. Also an announcement, you guys might have seen it on Facebook, but congratulations to Chad and Courtney Sims. They had a baby girl this week, and I believe, if I read my notes right, Capri is her name. So that means that Tammy has become a grandma again. Woohoo! That is all of our announcements. Anything else on the slides? No? All right then. So our affirmation of faith is next. Please join me for the Apostles' Creed or affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered by the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, Take your seats. The praise team is going to come up here and bless us with a rocking good time, I'm sure. <laughs> Nothing about setting the standards pretty high. <laughs> <laughs>
you so much for that. It is nice having music back in church. I tell you, praise the Lord. Concerns anyone other than what's listed in the bulletin? Father, we thank you for letting us gather here, and we come together and ask in prayer for the people of our congregation, for the friends in our community, for our neighbors. We lift up to you, Cindy Abel, and let that help Barbara, Danny Barfield, and Tim Baker. We lift up Jared Coombs, Edie Early, Guy and Faye Edwards. We lift up Hayden Edwards. Turn this down so people can see you, all right? Now, did you pick this out? Or did you? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Should I be scared? Stumper. No? A stumper. Now, remember, nothing living, nothing dead. Whew. Okay. Oh my okay. God. Gary. 
you're going to get them one. There's a bag of lollipops, too. So you're going to probably add it on your hand. If it was a snake, it would have bit you. <laughs> you would have found the snake. But you found the lollipop bag now, okay? <laughs> uh, children's church, I love it. I guess we should fix this so people uh, are, can join us. Uh, I love it. I love how God watches over us and just the way kids can see God. It's just amazing their insights. Our Old Testament reading today is from Psalms 119, 33 to 40. I liked when I read through it, I had not figured out what I was going to preach on yet. And then I read it, and then I reread it, and I was like, wow, this actually does tie into our sermon topic. Uh, so I'll read it to you today. Uh, again, Psalm 119, 33 to 40. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end, giving me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes, and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant, so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts, and your righteousness preserve my life. Word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Amen. Our sermon today is on love. If you guys had bulletins and eventually, yes, we'll be getting back to passing those out. The sermon title you can see is love. But it's really a what is love? Why love? And as I thought about this concept of love, I was like, who better to explain how we see love than in our congregation. So Steve is going to take a mic around. You can come on up. It's okay, Steve. And I have asked a couple of our members to explain what they have learned about love. And they're, oh, I think most of these are over 30 years of marriage. Um, but feel free to tell us how many when, when you do it. Brenda, uh, I think you're first on the list. We've been married 41 years, um, and I tried to look at the Bible and try to, you know, this, this past week, I tried to look at things to say, okay, this is what your actual marriage should be based on. And actually, marriage should be based on the love of God. Um, because, it, you know, in Corinthians it says, love is patient and kind, it's not bashful. It's not whatever, whatever. Is it patient? You have to be patient. Um, throughout the years, we have, the road's not been easy. We work shift work. Um, different, you know, he would work evening shift, I'd work midnight shift, or he'd work day shift, and I'd work evening shift. You know, that right there is stressful. Through motorcycle wrecks, through working with corrections, through diseases that we did not account for coming on in our life, we've made it. And we're going to continue to make it. Because number one, God is behind us. God's walking every step. And for people that are young in marriage, it's too easy to give up. But you took that stand. You said, for better or for worse, and sickness and hell. Do I ever cry myself to sleep sometimes? Yes, and I bet everybody that's ever been married does from time to time. But we know that God will get us through any situation. And marriage is a wonderful thing. You can live, you can love, and as long as you're waking up together and going to bed together, you've got it made. One day I know that one of us will cross and then go 
The other one will just have to hope that soon the other one will fall asleep. Yeah. The three will read for they'll think for marriage itself. Stay strong. Stay faithful. Don't go to bed angry. Always forgive. And it's not 50-50. It's 150-150. And without the support of my friends and church family, we probably wouldn't have made it this long. But then again, we still had God by our side. But the church family's a little extra. Love y'all. Thank you, Brenda. And I believe it's uh, Janice and Kenny are up next. <laughs> I, I think uh, your wife took this one. <laughs> Been married 47 years. Um, when I told Kenny about this little assignment, the first word that popped out of his mouth was patience. And I was very touched that he realized just how much patience it took for me to live with him. <laughs> <seven years. laughs> the, 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 the Bible book starts off love is patient, love is kind. And I think that kindness covers a lot of territory. If you're going to be kind, you're, you're, you're going to give, you're going to take. Um, you're going to put that person above you from time to time. Um, but most important, as Brenda said, is God, keeping God first. Um, so there's a little bit for y'all to think about. Uh, Ashley, you're going to have to have a lot of patience. <laughs> but yeah, does he hunt? Yeah. But yeah, just being, being kind and keeping God in your heart, I think, is the key. see love is it is powerful and it is different for all of us but there are things that are similar that tie it all together and in that as we look at how love is tied in scripture I want to take a look at our sermon scripture verse is Romans 13 8 to 10 and that's Romans 13 8 to 10 it says let no debt remain outstanding Accept the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law, the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly
Heavenly Father, we ask that you would open our minds, open our ears to hear your word, to let your Lord be alive inside us, to grow and to become strong so that we may be beaming lights of your great love throughout the world. Amen. So as we look at what love is, I thought we should probably also consider what love isn't. Obviously, love is not hatred. There's no room for hatred in love. Hate is a strong emotion. It's powerful. There are actions that we can hate, but we have to separate the action from the person. We're not to hate the people, but there are actions that we can hate and dislike and disapprove of, but not people. People we are to love. Love is not jealousy. In that commandment, it said not to covet. So love is not jealousy. Okay? Love is the opposite. It is the sharing. It is, it is the joining with friends and family of laughter. Love is also not selfish. In this world, too often, it's all about numero uno. Oh, me first. But that is not love. Love is putting someone else first. Love is putting someone else above where you're at. Love is taking care of that. But in our scripture, it said love is a fulfillment of the law, of the commandments. How is that possible? How does one thing, love, answer yes to all the commandments? So with that challenge, I said let's do the Ten Commandments and figure out love applies and how so the first commandment you shall have no other gods before me well if I love something I mean truly love something that is the most important thing if I truly love God there can be nobody else in that picture because that is the primary the next commandment you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. Well, when you love God, God takes priority, right? Now, college football is back on, right? It can be very tempting on Saturday to stay up and watch the West Coast games. Well, that might interfere with church Sunday morning, right? But if you truly love God, you're not setting football as an idol. That's not your priority, God is. Same thing happens at the movie theaters. It was interesting that I noted that on Wednesday nights when movie theaters were open, that was when the discounted tickets were. Did you guys realize that? A lot of movie theaters do like half off on Wednesdays. Yeah. Well, if I'm doing Wednesday nights, then I'm not a Wednesday night Bible study, right? So what am I setting as my priority? Am I putting something else before God? Third commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So, in marriage, we love our spouses. Sometimes we get a little frustrated with them, but we probably never misuse our spouse's name. The same is true of God. When God is the priority, when we fully love God in all aspects, are you ever going to use God's name in vain? No. And the fourth one, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Now, it may sound a little sexist, but I think men mess this up a lot, especially when it comes to our anniversary dates and remembering it. Um, it's a problem that we have in the, in the male brain, I think. But we love our spouse. So we do set a time aside for our spouses. But how much more do we love God? And is it not worthy for us to set aside designated time to be with the person that you love? And if you love God, then you're setting aside that time. So in just those first four commandments, we can see how love does fulfill it. How the act of love, how by truly engaging in love, God becomes the focus and the priority for 
everything in our lives. The other commandments, I think, are a little simpler. Well, kids might not uh, agree to it, but the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. You like it? Sorry, mom, dad, yeah. Uh, but honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So, when your parents or grandparents, you know, think about all the generations here, Sometimes they tell you to do something, and you may not understand why. So are you obedient because you love them, and you do what they say? Or are you disobedient, and you go against their wishes? So this is what we're pointing to with love. When do you love someone, you're obedient to them. There are numerous times in marriage where you may not understand why your spouse wants you to be somewhere something. But you still help out and do it because you love them. And the same is with God. We may not always understand why God's saying go this direction, turn down this road, but because we love God, we're going to be obedient and follow God. The sixth commandment, that one is even more blatantly easy to understand. You shall not murder. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. But I still wanted to challenge myself and look up. And I was like, well, what is murder? And according to Webster, it is the unlawful ending of someone's life. So I was like, all right. So it does differentiate. The soldier out on the combat field keeping the enemy away from us. The burglar that's breaking in and you protecting your household. Those are okay. But it's the unlawful ending of someone's life. And you think about that with your neighbors. So the Bible verses we talked about said, love your neighbor. Well, remember the other story when the, that lawyer guy went up to Jesus and said, well, who's my neighbor? You know, And Jesus pretty much pointed out, it's everyone. Okay? You shall not commit adultery. Again, pretty obvious. If you love someone, you're not going to mess around on them. But it happens. And it's sad. But it's because you don't put that person first. It's because you're being selfish when you mess around on your spouse. Same thing applies with God. If you're messing around on God, playing with those temptations, then you're not fully loving God. You're cheating on God. The Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal. What is it to steal? It doesn't hurt anyone, does it? If you shoplift from this big store over here, well, they got plenty of money. It doesn't hurt them. It does in the long term. When you steal, you are causing others pain. If you cause someone pain, does that violate the commandment to love your neighbor? We can see where, so far, the first eight commandments all can be followed without an issue if you love. The ninth commandment, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. So if you love everyone, do you talk positively about people or do you gossip and rumor? Do you sit on that front porch with your best friend and talk about, oh, Joe Snuffy down the road and about the bad things he's doing. Or do you help that person? So we're not supposed to give false testimony, it says. We're not supposed to spread rumors. We're not supposed to talk bad about our neighbors unwarranted. The 10th commandment. This one I thought was interesting, but only because I don't have an ox or a donkey. Uh, it says, you shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, or his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. But then I started thinking, well, ox and donkeys, that probably relates to, since that was their mode of transportation, their cars, their trucks, their jet skis, their boats. It says, I'm not supposed to covet that. And then I thought about in 
love again. Well, how does love affect what I covet? But the interesting part is, it's not coveting, oh, he has a nice TV. You know, I think I would like to have a nice TV down the road someday. That's, that's all right. It's, he has a nice TV. I want that TV. And I'm going to get that TV regardless of what it does to that person. That's the difference. So when you're stepping out, when you're trying to take from someone else, then it's not love. But if you love, then you don't have that desire to take. Okay? So that's, you know, in the Ten Commandments, how it sort of breaks out. And then we think about the opening comments from the couples in our church there. They brought up love is patient. Love is hard. Sacrifice. It's difficult to do on a daily basis. And then we start thinking about, well, what else does the Bible say about love? And so I went through the Bible. I'm not going to read every scripture on love in the Bible. I picked just the top four or five. So Brenda started, I thought she was actually going to quote the whole thing for me. But um, so it was a good lead in. Thank you, Brenda. And by the way, I had no idea what they were going to say. So I was just praying it would tie in. But 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It, is, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That, that section of scripture has been used in so many ways, so many sermons about how we are to treat one another. But I do find that one part of it is difficult for us. How do you keep no record of wrongdoing? We're humans. We keep score of almost everything. We have stats on baseball, on how many times a pitcher pitches to the left of the mound versus the right of the mound. We keep track of everything. So how do we not keep track when someone wrongs us? Is it possible? I don't know. But what is possible what we do with it. Do we forgive them or do we hold that grudge against them? And that's what you have to remember. So from that section of verse, the thing that jumped out was to hold no wrongdoings. And the only way we can do it is by openly forgiving our neighbors. Openly forgiving when our friend accidentally does something that upsets us. When our boss tells us that, hey, you're working an extra shift, but it's my son's baseball game. Well, you're working it or you're losing your job. There's things that we, it'll be tough, and we're going to remember it, but we still have to forgive. Now, John takes it even farther. In 1 John 4, 20, he says, Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. As I thought about this hating of brothers and sisters, a story, and bear with me because I, I think it's a great example of hate. So as many of you know, I grew up on a small farm. Um, behind the barn, there was a cow pasture that went down and there was a creek that ran through it. And there was a big old oak tree there. Well, my brothers and I, thought I was part of the decision, said we should build a fort up in that tree. So my brothers went ahead and did it. You know, they were older, they were much taller than me, and they went and built the fort. And unbeknownst to me, they were very smart with their design. See, as they nailed the two by fours into the tree, they made a door that if you held on to the top two by four and leaned out, you can undo the latch, which would then drop the door down and you could climb into the fort. Like I said, they were taller than me. They made the latch so they could reach it, but not me. 
So after about the fourth or fifth time of me climbing up there, reaching back, and then falling, but fortunately it was only like six or eight feet, to the ground, I stomped away, hating my brothers that day. Very frustrated with them. But this scripture's not talking about that type of childish hate, the hate that, you know, kids, they don't understand what hate means. This is talking about that hate where we, we hate a person, truly hate, and that that is not allowed. And that if we cannot love a person we see, if we can't look and say, I love you, how can you say, I love you to the God you cannot see clearly? That's what he's pointing to. So the verse is calling for us to love one another regardless of of where we're at, whether we're the boss or the employee, whether we're white or black, it doesn't matter. It says love your neighbor. Then Matthew takes it even further. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. It's pretty easy to love people that love you back, right? How hard is it to love that person that does not like you? That person that ridicules you, that picks on you? Wait, that is what the passage is calling out. That even that person we are to love. Again, the disciples are being very blunt. I love how they're writing it. They call us out on all our shortcomings in humanity, on how we look at love as this side and only this. He's like, no, there is so much more. John follows up in, verse, in chapter 13, verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Think about what he's talking about. He's recording what Jesus said in the command. So Jesus is going, love one another as I have loved you. He's calling out a difference. It's not how one human loves another. It's on how the Heavenly Father loves you. That is our goal. The last scripture that we're going to look at is one that you will all know. We were all re required to learn it in Sunday school. Bible schools. It's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If that's not love, I don't know what is. I can't think of any situation in the world where I could freely sacrifice my son to save someone else. And yet God did that. And that sacrifice, you know, that's, we're gonna, we're gonna do communion here in a little bit. And that sacrifice reminds us through the acts of communion what Jesus did.
I'm going to go through uh, the communion, and then at the end of it, you know, we'll take our little communion cups and open them up. Uh, I know there's been some trouble with them. If you look real close, there's this thin little clear plastic piece. If you pull that piece off first, that's the wafer, and the other piece is the juice. But on the at the Last Supper, Christ turned to his disciples and he took that bread and he broke that bread and he said this is my body broken for you eat this in remembrance of me and then following the dinner he took his glass and he raised it up drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, covenant shed for you. Do this often. Drink this and remember me. Those words, the thought of that communion of Christ's sacrifice is what we are participating in right now. So if you would please take, participate in the communion. Thank you all for coming.